So today's topic um, is around resilience, and it's kind of a timely topic. Uh, basically, what resilience uh, is generally translated as is the process of adopting, uh, adapting to stress well. And basically, you know, because of the pandemic and the economic crisis, all of us are having a whole lot more stress. Um, so I kind of want to talk a little bit about, first of all, kind of like the a, a model of resilience. And then I want to talk about various things that you can do to increase your resilience. All right, so I'm going to start actually with giving you some drawings. All right. So this is actually one of the like oldest Western psychological theories that's out there. And it's called the Yerkes Dotson curve. So how this works is you can imagine uh, there's stress kind of running on the x-axis and then there's performance running on the uh, the y-axis. And so there's kind of a way where there's like a there's a sweet spot with stress where I, I like to sometimes use the example if you if you tell a teenager I'll give you a dollar if you mow the lawn sometime this year it's it's probably going to be that the lawn doesn't actually get mowed because there isn't actually enough stress in the system for them to do a good job with the task that's there right if you tell them i'm going to give you 50 bucks but you have to do it this afternoon yeah, there's a better than average chance that it'll actually get done right and then if you tell them well i'm going to throw you out if you don't do it right now right it may still not get done because they get flooded all right. So there is a kind of sweet spot where, you know, just if we were to kind of draw artificial lines here, kind of in the middle where people have kind of an adequate amount of stress and their performance is doing really, really well. And so for this, we're going to call that the resilient zone, All right? Kind of a sweet spot. And then we're going to call everything over here and call that flooded or distressed, right? And then over here, we're gonna call this zone defeated. So there's this way where um, when, uh, there's, there's an interesting model of the brain, you can kind of see it, where it's basically, it's Dan Siegel's hand model. So you can kind of imagine the brain's like this and your brain stems here, your emotional centers are here. And then the kind of parts of the brain that we generally think of as us, our ability to communicate effectively, our ability to plan ahead, our kind of best, best self kind of wraps around that. And there are times when the stress gets so high that we basically flip the lid, right? And we're no longer actually steering our system anymore. We're just reacting to essentially whatever's coming up in the environment. And that can show up kind of in, in one of two ways. Either it can be that one is uh, flooded and distressed and kind of overly reactive, or one's been in a high punishment environment for an extended period of time and they're just checked out and they're just kind of disengage. Often looks like pretty depressive, depressive uh, behavior. So I think it's, I think it's helpful um, to actually, like there's no, there's no chance that you can actually get to the resilient zone unless you realize you're not in that zone. And of course, insight, awareness is one of the first things to go out of the window when we get, when we get flooded or uh, defeated. So I think it's helpful to actually uh, just identify for yourselves kind of what are, what are like your typical signs um, that you might be getting kind of more in that like flooded or distressed zone. Like, how do you know that you're there? I'm just going to write some of those down. All right. So how do you know, like if someone was watching you from the outside and you were getting flooded, how would they tell? How would they know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like more, more active kind of pacing, tense muscles. What happens to your sleep when you're in that, when you're in that sort of state? Yeah, so someone's commenting, kind of becoming easily frustrated. Maybe you shout, maybe you um, find yourself having early morning waking, right? 
does anyone kind of like get stuck on the news or get stuck staring at your bank account? Yeah, some people freeze. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of put freeze down here, um, in which it's like we've kind of stopped engaging with the problem, right? And so we just kind of get frozen, right? If we we're in that more sort of defeated mode, we might say like, "What's the point? What? Why? Why bother?" Right. We uh, comfort eating. Is that a pretty common one? So. I think one thing is that it's it's helpful, first of all, to actually know what yours are, because everyone will have kind of like unique ways that this shows up for them. But it's helpful maybe to even just have like your top one that when you see yourself in that state, it's a good opportunity to work on active coping skills. So you get back into that sort of resilient zone. Does that make sense? So a, a way to do that, um, uh, it's actually, it's just starting with mindfulness. And so mindfulness, I'm going to break down into three separate categories. Participate. So the first thing that we have to do, and this is by, by having you kind of write this stuff out, um, is actually to start with being able to observe when you are actually, if you, if you find yourself shouting, if you find yourself having early morning waking, that's the first process is just being able to observe. Uh, that's the thing that's happening right now. Um, the, the next kind of level up from that is to be able to describe it. So one of the things that happens when we kind of flip our lid is that our capacity for language starts to drop out, right? So there's a, there's a very different thing from kind of subjectively knowing, oh, I'm upset, uh, to being able to actually verbalize, I'm upset right now, or I'm feeling dysregulated. So the, the second step of mindfulness is actually to be able to describe it. It's to add language to it. And the third step, and it's kind of the most complex part of mindfulness, is to participate. It's to do something uh, in response to what you're observing. Now, the thing is, you're already you're always already doing something. So sometimes with mindfulness, the thing that you do is actually just to sit still, just to kind of like you know, do nothing in response. Um, but sometimes it might be some of the strategies that we're actually going to kind of go into with with resilience. All right. Um, I'll just add kind of one or two more things to this, just because I think it's kind of cool to look at it. So if we're drawing kind of like someone who is um, having a harder time with resilience, uh, their curve might look kind of more like that, right? In which there's like a very kind of narrow range in which they're not feeling flooded or they're not feeling defeated, right? And so what resilience would try to be doing is to kind of like broaden the base in which we're able to perform at a high level more of the time. Yeah. And just to be a little bit geeky about it, um, there's actually different types of curves depending on how complex the situation is. So um, for simple tasks, the curve looks a little bit more like this. Right? And for more complex tasks, it looks a little bit more like this. And so the idea is, uh, like, if my wife and I are having uh, company over, you better believe that we're going to be playing really fast music about an hour before guests are coming, because we're going all over the house, cleaning up things, we're putting things away, right? And we're playing faster music to basically increase the amount of stress in our system so that we do cleaning very, very well. Uh, so there's some task we actually want more stress. It's actually more adaptive, right? But if we are doing our taxes, right, we might play classical music or drones, things where the idea is that we're trying to shift the physiology down. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So let me just see. Took my notes. Yeah. So. With training resilience, once you kind of notice um, that you've maybe gotten dysregulated and you're trying to get kind of more into that resilient zone, um, I, I want to I use kind of a metaphor or two around, uh, around resilience. I mean, so 
when presented with the problem of walking barefoot through the forest, um, what we often will encounter are these things like sharp rocks and sharp sticks, right? And of course, what all of us want is to have a forest that doesn't have sharp sticks. We don't, we don't like it. It's uncomfortable when we step on them. And so I think, I think the thing that a lot of people do, which is, um, you know, it's like they, they want to try to organize their life so that there are no more sharp edges, that it doesn't sting anymore. And an equally valid solution would be to actually wrap your feet in like a nice, you know, comfortable shoe in which you're able to handle those stressors more. And that's part of what kind of a more resilient attitude is that the problems don't go away. The stressors don't go away. You're still called to somehow adjust or adapt to the problem as it's presenting itself. Right? So we're not trying to make the things go away. We're trying to increase our ability to effectively respond to it. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, yeah, so um, you might turn to the worksheet uh, that, that I handed out. And what I'd like to do, I'm gonna go through um, uh, each of these 10 factors. Uh, this is from a, uh, a, a pretty good book on resilience by Southwick and Charney, uh, which kind of describes trainable ways that people can increase their resilience. So I'm gonna go through each of the factors, but what I'd like you to do is try to listen for which of those factors that is your strong suit, which one you already do well, and then maybe which one is kind of the weakest one, which one that you could actually prioritize doing more of, okay? So um, the first one on there is called having a positive attitude. Uh, I deal with positive attitude. Uh, basically, the, the mind is already kind of defaulted to pay attention to all the sticks. Uh, it is a trainable skill to pay more attention to the carrots, but our default mode is actually to be very threat sensitive, right? So if you, if you want a more positive attitude, you can actually intentionally kind of steer the mind towards paying attention to things that are working well. There are some uh, classic exercises to do that. You can actually, uh, if you think about some problem that you're having, you can generate every way that the problem will actually not be as severe or somehow get solved. And it's a trainable skill. We don't necessarily have to buy all of those thoughts, but it's more about uh, cultivating that it's, that it's possible. Over time, what you start to have is, you know, just a more balanced view where the mind doesn't kind of automatically shut down and say, oh, it's going to be the worst possible scenario. There's still kind of this like possibility of it being open, a possibility being there. Yep. Um, another, uh, another, the second one on the sheet is having a stable moral compass. So I think uh, I'll give you, I'll give you an example of this. Um, if you ask someone to put their hand in a bucket of ice water, for as long as they can tolerate, it turns out it's not all that long. Maybe not a big surprise. People kind of don't like pain and discomfort, right? If you ask someone to put their hand in a bucket of ice water and imagine that their child has fallen into an icy lake and that they're reaching into the lake in order to grab their child, suddenly the fact that it's painful or not doesn't really matter anymore. So there are times with resiliency where it's, it's not so much about um, like, would you like suffering or not? It's more about would you like suffering or would you like suffering with a purpose? So if you can be really, really clear about like, what are the reasons that you would be willing to have pain and discomfort? It can make the pain and discomfort that much more tolerable. Um, the third one on there, having resilient role models. Um, I really like this one. I mean, it turns out we're, we're such a kind of social species that we do mimicking very, very well, that we tend to take models from other people. Um, and so you might kind of think about people that you think do resiliency really, really well. Um, for me, Martin Luther King is, uh, is a role model on, on that regard. I mean, like, 
if I could ever aspire to do some of the, you know, essentially bodhisattva uh, work that he did. He's, he's a classic modern saint, right? Uh, reading, you know, his, le his letters from a mobile jail is like, it's, it's part of that. So if you can kind of think, if there are other people that you know to be resilient, and you can kind of think how they are, um, how they might respond to the situation that you're in, that might help with kind of the modeling of resiliency. So I want to I want to pause because I'm just kind of like yammering at you. Is there, is there any questions or observations, anything that people want to share, kind of in response to all this? All right, we'll move on to number four. So. Uh, sometimes resiliency is described as an anti-fragile attitude. Got it? Yeah, someone say that they've, they've not really considered using stress to their advantage. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, sometimes psychologists talk about the difference between use stress and distress. Um, distress being it's primarily stress that we're trying to get away from. Use stress would be the sort of stress that you would experience having a child or uh, planning a wedding in which actually the this, this stress is your ally. It's trying to get you to raise to a particular uh, task so that you can effectively adapt to it. Yeah, and then someone saying that they've heard about imagining that you are a superhero living in your exact life situation. Now think about how you'd respond to it. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good example of having a resilient role model. And someone commenting, that method sounds kind of overwhelming. The method of the role model or which which method? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, su superheroes work for some people. Um, it it kind of doesn't matter uh, what uh, the, the, the person is that you're trying to model after. Superhero, if that feels like it's way over the top and that you can't, um, kind of mimic that, don't use that. Um, I think this is where, uh, w when some Christians say, what would Jesus do? They're using you know, that, that kind of Christ-like figure. You can also do it for you know, like your, your older brother, you could do it for your pastor, you could do it for you know, essentially any figure that works for you. Yeah, uh, what, would, what would Batman do? He'd probably throw some punches, yep. Or he'd invest a billion dollars in the Batcave. <laughs> that I would encourage doing that. Yeah. And so knowing that suffering is inevitable, it's a common and recurring human condition, offers opportunities to enhance gratitude, connects to humanity. Yeah. So there's kind of um, actually, glad, I'm glad you're bringing that up. I mean, I think. It's, it's one point going back to having a stable moral compass. Um, ob obviously, all of us uh, don't want to suffer. If that's an option, most of us would, would take that. Um, I think there, there's kind of a certain, um, there's a certain moral stance in which if not suffering is not available, there can be a certain dignity in choosing how you suffer. Right, so it's like, I, I don't have control right now over this part, but I do have a control over whether I can be grateful for what's going right in my life or whether I can be kind to my children or my friends. I can choose that type of suffering. Uh, is it possible to build resistance without suffering? Say more. Uh, resilience. Uh, is it possible to build resistance without suffering? I suppose it kind of um, matters how you define suffering. So we could probably like say suffering like is includes a certain amount of resistance to the experience. And so if you're not resisting, if it is just the stressful experience without you know trying to control it, trying to make it go away, all the extra stuff, then we might call that stress without suffering. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, yeah. And you know, suffering and spirituality often do go together. Yeah. And hopefully, yeah, if if the struggle is going to do anything, it would actually result in a sense of personal growth, personal development. Absolutely. Great observations, y'all. You're you're an amazing group. This is great. The story behind your mind is crucial. God, you guys are rock stars, superheroes. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. 
All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to to point four on here, um, and it's uh, routinely routinely facing one's fears. Um, so this uh, this is kind of an interesting interesting place to work. Um, having having an anti fragile attitude um, often like if you if you kind of make the switch, it's like fear actually becomes your your best friend. That becomes the place to practice. Um, so when the Dalai Lama was asked uh, who his most important spiritual teacher was, he said Mao Zedong, right? So it's like there's this kind of like anti-fragile attitude where whatever comes at you, you're going to work with it as best as you can and kind of lean into it. Um, so uh, you can imagine it's, it's like the equivalent of uh, going outside when uh, it's, ro it's raining, right? our default habitual protective tendency is to, is to try to like close up and kind of protect ourselves from that discomfort. And an anti-fragile way would actually be to, to kind of open up and just let the discomfort be there. So you might kind of think about like, what are, what are ways that fears uh, sometimes block you, right? Um, is it public speaking? Is it initiating conversations with people? Is it asserting with your boss around uh, having a raise? Is it asserting with your partner around doing the dishes, right? Are there fears there and can you kind of open, in, open up and lean into the discomfort? Um, point five on there is uh, supportive social networks. Um, we are absolutely a tribal species without a doubt um you know there's there's actually kind of interesting research on uh kind of what happens when we get really isolated or we, we get really alone um so there's a there's a uh field of psychology called uh, social baseline theory and it's kind of this idea of like what is actually the baseline that we all adopted uh, adapted to um, so some of the, th some of the ways that they study this is that if you, if you ask a person, like how far away is that, that other hill, they'll tell you whatever number. Um, if you give them a backpack that weighs 50 pounds, suddenly the hill gets kind of further away, right? Um, but if you give them a buddy, suddenly the hill gets a lot closer because the challenge isn't as bad, right? Um, and, but the thing is, it has to be a buddy. Like it can't just be an acquaintance or someone that you just met, right? It has to be someone that you think is actually going to be helpful for your sense of resourcing. So uh, part of being resilient is actually like feeling well resourced by the community that you're in, right? Um, so thinking about like who you might be able to call if you're having a problem, who you can actually reach out to is just part, part of being resilient. Yeah. Um, Point six on there is recognizing and fostering strengths. So this is this is kind of an interesting one. I think in our in our culture, um, we often are encouraged kind of not not to stand out too much, not to brag, not to be narcissistic. And I think there's you know there's there's definitely benefits to that. Um, but I wonder you know when you see family and friends talk about the things that they are proud of. Right, or things that they like about themselves. Right? Can you notice how that might change the quality of conversation for you? Like how you feel when someone is able to say, you know, like I can say one thing, I'm a good dad. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that, of how I show up. You notice how that kind of like shifts your sense of closeness to them, right? And there's this weird thing where we often are unwilling to do that for ourselves. So this is just part of the kind of social resourcing. It's like, if you, if you know, no, no, it's like, I, I know how to do this stuff, right? I, I, I have capacities, I have abilities, I can uh, uh, respond to this part of the challenge, right? It has a way of making you more resilient. Yeah, and then um, active coping skills, uh, there's just, I mean, there's so many different forms of coping skills that are, that are out there. And it kind of it kind of doesn't actually matter what the skills are that you're using. It just matters that you have them, right? So if you're if you're getting into a place where say you're being flooded, 
right? And you want to ball your foot, your fists up, and punch a wall, right? Then there there are particular skills that you can use that you can rehearse routinely, so that when you're in that state, you can re-regulate yourself back into the resilient zone. Right? And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be that you go for a walk. It could be that you call a friend. It could be that you do as many push-ups as you possibly can stand. It could be that you do particular forms of breathing. Right? It could be that you do a formal mindfulness exercise. And you can distract yourself. Like There's so many different ways that you can do that. So it might be if you, if you don't have that, is maybe just to write out, like, well, how can you do that? Or what's worked at other times? All right, I'm going to I'm going to pause there for a sec. Kind of comments, observations. Uh, someone say that thought uh, the key to resilience in coping is flexibility. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when uh, a, a another term for psychological health is behavioral flexibility. Right. So if I am feeling um, nice and relaxed and, uh, you know, like all of my needs are met, everything's taken care of, I have a pretty wide behavioral range, right? I can respond to whatever's kind of coming up in a, in a whole variety of different ways. I could, you know, if someone uh, was to criticize me, I could use humor, I could change the topic, I could choose to walk out of the room. Uh, there's like a wide range of behavioral flexibility there. As we get more and more and more stressed, the window of behavioral flexibility gets uh, smaller and smaller. And so we become more rigid, more inflexible, right? So you, you might have your kind of typical stereotype reaction, whatever, whatever that is, right? So resilience you know, is kind of having a wider behavioral range, being more flexible. And actually that's point nine on there, but we're not there yet. Yeah. Um, let's see. So point eight, physical well-being. Um, <clears throat> if I could get everyone that I work with to exercise most days and to meditate most days, I think I would be out of a career. Um, you know, it's, it is, there's, uh, exercise is sometimes known as a keystone behavior um, in which you can kind of imagine uh, an arch of bricks and then there's a keystone at the top that holds them all together. When we think about people who exercise, it kind of tells you all sorts of other things that are in there that will influence physical well being. So, people who exercise tend to drink less alcohol, they tend to smoke less, they tend to sleep better, they tend to have better social relations, right? All of that stuff, it's like you don't need to worry about changing all of those if you're not exercising. Go ahead and start doing that. And if you are, are not doing that, you also don't have to like start from zero and go straight into a marathon. You might think about where you are and what you could consistently do every day. So you might start with five minutes or 10 minutes, anything to kind of like start that process up, right? And within a couple months, you're running marathons. Nice. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna circle back to that kind of uh, behavioral flexibility piece, and that's that's kind of around uh, point nine on there. Uh, so cognitive flexibility, basically, you know, it's like when when we get more and more threatened, uh, the we have to kind of use more and more black and white thinking to respond to threats. So, like if if a tiger has come in the room. I'm not going to be, you know, wondering, like, has the tiger eaten recently? Is it in a good mood? Is there a trainer nearby? I'm just going to, like, collapse all of that down to say, oh, there's a threat, right? And there's no, like, if, bands or, if ands, or buts about it, I got to get out of there as fast as I can, right? Most, thankfully, most of the time, there's actually no real tiger. There's a lot more nuance to the problems that we might be facing. And so uh, part of being resilient is like, it's the capacity to 
uh, think differently or take different perspectives. Um, like a lot of the work of therapy when people are in conflict is just kind of inviting them, well, you know, like, uh, what could that person's motivation have been? Can you kind of see where they were coming from on that point? Right. So it's like it's like being able to actually do perspective taking. And we I mean, we sometimes do that actually just for as many different ways as possible um, in which if you were a fly on the wall, what would you have seen in the room or uh, what would your grandmother have said to you about that situation? So that's more of the like compassionate perspective taking. Yep. And then the, the last point on there, um, uh, it's it's tr it's multimodal training. So very often, uh, resilient people have a practice that they are doing of some type, right? So this is where uh, some of the spiritual disciplines, uh, particularly ones that uh, kind of have multimodal pieces. So this is a uh, tradition, like martial arts is, is a fairly classic example of it, in which with martial arts, you are uh, training physically, right? Uh, but you are also training socially you're learning how to be in competition with someone and a really good system would also include some type of intellectual study in which you might include the history of the martial art or the lineage of the martial art there there are other systems like that um, i mean i'm i'm a personal fan of uh, buddhist systems um but i but there are lots of other kind of traditions that have that it's just helpful it's like it, it's a cross training as it were so you're being in some sort of system that challenges you socially, challenges you emotionally and intellectually, right, and helps you kind of develop multiple skills. So I think that's that's all I got. I want to um, open it up to comments and observations, questions, anything I can be helpful with. Well, let me let me ask actually. So going through that, can you identify like what is your strongest of those? Which one are you best at of those 10? Mm, cognitive flexibility, positive attitude, that must be nice. Coping mechanisms, active coping skills. What, what are some of your favorite coping skills? Yoga, awesome. Yep, another yogi in the house, excellent seems to cluster around Chad and Brian for sure. Yeah. Music, art, exercise, running. Ah, interesting. Someone commenting that they're good at suffering, but wanting to change that because that's not really resilience. Would, would you mind saying more? Yeah. So uh, being good at being good at suffering uh, sometimes includes a certain amount of stoicism or toughness. Right. And maybe that kind of gave you just re reading between the lines, kind of like, uh, um, just take it, just kind of suck it up attitude. And, and I think, I think sometimes with that, it's like, if we're talking about strengths, it's, it's helpful to acknowledge that is a strength. It's an asset. It's a skill. Right. Um, and so we don't necessarily want to short change ourselves by saying that we have to get rid of this asset. Um, it's more just about kind of broadening the portfolio so there are other things that you might engage in. You don't have to get rid of the good, right? It's just about kind of bolstering other parts. Yeah. Uh, for those of you with a positive attitude, how do you do it? What's your, what's your secret? So someone commenting that their, their moral compass is one of their strengths, having a positive attitude, and then kind of learning to face, face their fears. Yep. Yeah. Uh, finding that facing your feel, uh, fears helps maintain a positive attitude. Yeah, excellent. Got a therapy fan? Yeah, we like therapy fans. Great. So how about how about kind of weaknesses or areas areas to kind of grow in? Of those of those ten, what would you say is your like? Uh, I could spend an hour working on that. Finding role models, yep. I'll just use the kind of first first three, and I'll, I'll riff off those. Oh, recognizing strengths, all right. Okay, 
Um, so I, I think with each of these, uh, let me see. So I'll just mention what someone, what someone said with kind of po positive attitude. Um, and you're absolutely correct that uh, gratitude is, uh, is absolutely one of the practices that you can do that can really, really help develop more of a positive attitude. Um, one thing I'll, I'll say about gratitude practice, very often the way that I've seen people use it is uh, it's very dry. Um, it's like it's very conceptual or very cognitive, right? So like I am thankful that I have a warm, like, and there's, there's no kind of heart to it. Um, so a, a practice that I like for developing gratitude um, is actually to, to look for the bodily response to it. And we can all do this here. It's if you, if you acknowledge one thing that has had a like vaguely pleasant tone to it, say in the past 24 hours, uh, it could be your cat coming up. It could be that you had a nice uh, coffee or tea this morning, right? It could be, you know, that you watched a nice show last night. It's any, like, it's any, like, even just small, subtle, subtle thing, right? But when you make contact with it, trying to notice kind of, like, where the sweetness of that actually hits your body. So very, very often it'll be kind of in the chest, could be in the abdomen. And when you notice that, you try to almost kind of breathe in and out of the space to sort of amplify it, to savor it. Right? And then you just take, you take a good 15 seconds, a good 20 seconds to let the goodness of that moment kind of stick. Because our default mode will just go kind of onto the next threat. But if you take those pauses to actually let it hit your system, it starts to train the mind to look for the goodness. So someone's commenting kind of about struggles with, with support networks. All right. Um, how do you connect to the heart? So instead of practicing gratitude for things, uh, focusing on things in my body. Yeah, yeah, it's taking, it's taking a moment uh, whenever there is like, uh, um, if you steer the mind towards pleasurable, enjoyable qualities of whatever, whatever experience that you've had in the day, you then kind of look for the feel good sensation in the body and you try to keep the attention on the feel good sensation for as long as you can. And at first it might be a second, right? But the longer you do it, the more you can kind of relish or savor, or you can hang out in the feeling of good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so even like knowing that you're cultivating strength motivates you in the midst of weakness. That is a resilient attitude if I've ever heard one. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so people kind of mentioning, um, there's a couple things in here. Uh, support networks. Uh, reminds me of uh, this, this thing called the Benjamin Franklin effect. Uh, it's my like geeky history lesson for you. So Benjamin Franklin was like apparently a very, very excellent statesman. Um, and one of the ways that he got really good at it is that he would ask for little favors from people, right? So he would take someone who um, like didn't particularly like him or wasn't particularly warm and he would ask them for like a really small reasonable favor that would be hard to refuse. And then over time, when they found themselves uh, doing that thing back, they actually found themselves feeling more warm towards the person, right? And that helped to actually enhance the sense of cooperation. Right? So it might be, it might be um, uh, if you're kind of looking to expand your support network, you might consider using the Benjamin Franklin effect. And see if you might be able to call people up and just ask them for like the favor of their opinion on something or they can can they give you like a moment to give you advice on something you're looking for that right and even if that's not really what you're looking for what you'll find is that the warmth the quality of the relationship starts to improve when you do that you might have the other person reaching out to you as well as you reaching out to them through suffering when you're feeling totally frozen in fear uh yeah yeah so 
Um, social phobia, kind of speaking phobia, is an interesting an interesting one. Um, the with number four, where we're kind of facing our fears, um, there's a there's a sweet spot for um, uh, how, how much of the feared thing you're actually going to uh, expose yourself to. So if I had a patient who was afraid of water for whatever reason, I probably wouldn't pick them up on day one of therapy and just throw them into the swimming pool and say, good luck, right? You'd actually go through a process of like slowly, slowly walking up to them. Um, and as long as the person doesn't bail, they're essentially learning, oh, I can be with this fear. So if you're talking about kind of fear of public speaking, um, it's the same thing. You might kind of think of like a scale of one to 10, right? And one might be uh, uh, loudly returning a dish at a restaurant or uh, speaking up in like a Zoom meeting like this, right? And then a 10 might be, you know, giving a, giving a talk to a hundred people. Right. And we just practice kind of where you're willing to tolerate that as you build up from that and eventually you have enough learning experiences where you say, uh, well, when I, when I feel this discomfort, it doesn't mean I need to do anything about it. Uh, it's just my, it's just my body alerting me to a stressor. Yeah, and uh, if you're feeling on the deep end with new obligations in your jobs, rehearsal is really helpful. So you might consider uh, taking some time to practice and really kind of groove that uh, response into the nervous system. And you can start to practice just with like doing it with eyes closed. Uh, you could uh, have pictures of coworkers that you put on your desk that you're practicing in front of, right? Where it's just, it's just priming the nervous system for that. It's, it's the same thing actually with uh, talking about strengths. So a lot of us have phobias around, oh, I can't talk about myself in that way. And it's, you know, it's the same thing that you can kind of like, you could pick a place that feels somewhat comfortable to practice that in. That could be, you know, with a partner or with a friend, someone that you feel is not gonna shame you for, for being able to talk about your strengths, right? And then just build up from there, keep the practice going. Yeah, and role, role models is also kind of working, working with role models, getting yourself to kind of have people that you admire is a, uh, that's a it's a sticky topic for a lot of people. Um, another way that I sometimes like to approach it with folks is kind of imagining the, the person that you want to develop into. Um, so you might think, I mean, we're, we're all on kind of a developmental process hopefully the person that we find at the end of life is wise, is compassionate, is skillful, has learned from a lifetime of experience. So sometimes with role models, you can kind of, you can kind of play with like, well, what would my future self say to me about this? Right. If, you know, like I'm afraid to ask my, my boss for uh, time off so that I can, you know, take care of myself. Oh, what would my future self say to me you know, 20 years from now? How's that guy going to feel about me asking for time off or not? Or at least for me, he might say, yeah, it's worth it, bud. You deserve some time off. Yeah. The question that came via private chat for earlier. Let's see. Curve is really steep. How do we help friends develop more resiliency? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you can almost think of resiliency as a kind of, uh, it's like a, it's a life philosophy in a way. And the more resilient that you become, inevitably, when friends and family are talking to you about the problems that they're facing, this, this can also be kind of a way of responding. So it's the, it, like returning to the metaphor of the, the forest and the sharp sticks and such. Um, then like there is an equally valid option about you know, making sure that you are more resilient, that you've got a good layer of protection around you. So I think that's one of the ways that we help friends that we kind of remind the network that resiliency is an option. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, uh, one of the greatest gifts that you 
can do uh, for someone that is really suffering is to just like, is to acknowledge that they are suffering. Turns out validation um, is often one of the things that people find inherently regulating. Like it's, it's really, really hard uh, to stay angry at someone who is telling you you have every right to be angry for this. Right. Similarly, if someone's got a trauma history and they're really struggling with the current virus, it's just being able to say, like, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, so the more, the more that you do this stuff, that, that kind of like steep curve where you're, you're prone to overwhelm very, very quickly, the more that this stuff is practiced, the more kind of automatic it becomes. Yeah. Um, children and resiliency. So, uh, you know, interesting thing with, uh, with kids, often, um, I'm not a child expert, but often how uh, children express uh, this sort of stuff is through play. So they're not, they're not as good at kind of being able to form coherent narratives about this, um, but being able to have them have kind of a wide range of play. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that you'd be seeing uh, with children uh, a lot more kind of doctor care, a lot more like emergency care kind of show up in their, in their play. And I think it's okay to just kind of play with them to show as an adult that you're there kind of having, having, that, um, having that with them. It's part of the kind of social network that you're building that up. Um, and I wish I had actually better answers for children, but it's definitely not my, uh, it's not my, my specialty as much. Help to play, pretend with them scenarios where they are strong, supported. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, ones where they might be able to take kind of like a leadership role, right? And others are kind of responding to them being able to do that. Or I guess vice versa, superheroes who eat dinner and go to bed on time for the win. Yeah, excellent. All right, well, I think that's me. Yeah, sharing stories. Yep, yep. Resilient stories becomes part of that kind of role modeling. Yep, nice. God, you guys are doing great. All right. Yeah, very good. Okay, I think that's me. Thank you so much. is uh, is good to it's good to hang out with you, and I hope this is I hope this is helpful.